first we have from Advantage CS, please welcome the VP and Chief Product Manager, Daniel Heffernan. Daniel. One second to get the clicker. And Daniel, on your marks. I'm ready. Get set. Go. Video. Where is it? There we are. If you've overcome all of the following challenges, Come on, come on. Uh, you've implemented a new marketing offer on your website in under an hour with no help from your web programmers. You have changed the positioning of website elements in under 15 minutes with no help from your web programmers. You've been able to alter your website theme in under three days. You can adjust the shopping cart workflow in under an hour. You can offer both subscribed and non-subscribed products in a package. You can offer access to content behind your paywall and a conference registration and an ebook and membership dues in a package. You've solved that. You can tie your e commerce platform to your subscription engine, and you've tied your e commerce platform to your continuity logic. It's all tied together. And you provide marketing intelligence tools that are integrated with your transactional data. You can give that 360 view of your customers' activities to your marketers and to your customer service team and finance. So if you've overcome all these challenges, then don't give me your business card. So Advantage is the global software solution for all of the products that you see here. We've been doing this for a very long time. Marketing, sales, payments, business intelligence, and we have an e-commerce platform which will help marketers to create landing pages and create all of your website administration. So, if you are going to give me your business card, I'll email you within 48 hours, and I'll be at the speaker's corner. Thank you. <laughs> Superbly timed. Uh, thank you very much for that. Okay, next up we have uh, one pass, and uh, please welcome CEO Duncan Brown and Head of Sales and Strategy, Robert Cottrell. Ray. Hi. Which made me and Duncan think, what if coffee shops sold coffee the way that publishers sell content? I'd like a cup of coffee, please. I'm sorry, sir. You'll have to buy a subscription. Oh, I, I just want a cup of coffee. <sighs> sir, what do you think would happen if we just sold a cup of coffee to anybody who came in here and wanted to buy one? Well, maybe you'd sell a lot more coffee. Smart ass. I tell you what, sir. I'll give you one free cup, mm. so long as you fill in our registration form, read our terms and conditions, Accept our cookie, and I'll send you an email every day for the rest of your life. Smart ask yourself. <laughs> I'll get some tea next door. Thank okay, you. Okay, so what do you think? We're turning away 90% of our customers. Is there a better way? Yes. Sell people what they want to buy. Subscriptions are great. Hold your subscribers close. But reach out to the other 90% of people who want to buy single articles. And we've built and road tested the perfect tool for single article sales. It's called OnePass, and as we say in Shoreditch, London, it'll knock your socks off. OnePass enables publishers to sell single articles directly to anyone with an email address. We give publishers buy buttons, and we run prepaid accounts for readers. At which point you're going to say, doesn't Blendle do this? No, no, no. Blendle sells your content on Blendle. Ah, and with OnePass, you sell your content from your website. You own the reader, the context, and the relationship. Ads are imploding and paywalls are pooped. Let people pay to read what they want, when they want. Do that, and we're into a new golden age of paid content. And it's your content, by the way. It should be your gold. The readers are ready. The technology is ready. It's called OnePass. We're the noisy guys on Stand 26. Come and make some noise with us. And we've even <laughs> baked a cake, just so that we can say, you can have your cake. And eat it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, maybe a second or two over there, but we'll let that go for entertainment value alone. OnePass are just outside. Uh, I think they're worth a visit just on the basis of, uh, of dramatic potential. Um, right, next up, um, it's uh, Vindicia, possibly Vindicia. Uh, please welcome uh, SVP for monetization, um, Chris Nagel. Chris. Thank you. Well, that's a tough act to follow. Uh, I am Chris Nagel from Vindicia. There will be a test later. Uh, we are here sponsoring the event with our partner, Marketing G2. And I always like to start out talking about how our clients use us. Clients like Hearst Digital with their Cosmo Body, Next Issue Media with their rollout of the subscription magazine service in the U.S. 
uh, the Tribune companies in the case of Marketing G2. Uh, we've got a fantastic client list managing over 220 users, uh, 220 million users around the world with 250 uh, key tier one digital accounts around the world. So what are we doing for them? We're helping them engage users. We're helping them convert those engaged users to paying users, whether it be a single transaction flow, a subscription flow, or otherwise and then helping to retain those users. But fundamental under all of this is a data architecture that allows you to, to leverage data from your own system as well as from publishers around the world to maximize the value of that user data, that content data, and that purchase data to your advantage in rolling out new products and services around the world. Uh, this is uh, my personally my, per, my first FIP event. I have enjoyed it very much. Had a chance to talk to a number of you. We are in stand 31 out front. I'm keeping it short and sweet. Thank you. Excellent work, Chris. Thank you very much. You certainly win the prize for, for, for brevity and for impact, I think. So we're, we're all welcome. Short presentations are good presentations. Thank you. Uh, and see Chris uh, outside, as he mentioned. OK, uh, you're now much better informed about a whole uh, host of things. Um, and it's now time uh, to move into the deep dive into some of those trends we saw uh, yesterday. Um, a couple of years ago, it was digital first. Could we do that? If you're in yesterday's mobile session, you'll know that mobile first uh, is kind of uh, where we're at and, and where a lot of the smart money is going. Um, so to talk to us about um, how a mobile first brand really works, uh, please welcome the editor-in-chief, co-founder, and co-president, three job titles in one, from Quartz, Kevin Delaney. Kevin. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Kevin Delaney. We co -founded, uh, I co-founded Quartz in uh, 2012, so just about three years ago. We're the global business news site owned by Atlantic Media, which is the parent company of the Atlantic Magazine, which many of you probably know. Uh, when we launched Quartz, our goal, and there was a small troop of, uh, of uh, traditional people, traditional media veterans, uh, who did this. I worked at the Wall Street Journal for years. Our goal was to serve business professionals around the world with smart content designed to be read on whatever device they had near at hand. Quartz is found at qz.com. If you've not seen it yet, I won't be offended if during the session you go there and you browse and look at what we're doing. Quartz today is, um, has about 16 million uh, readers a month, about half of them in the US and about half outside of the US. We now have about 70 full-time journalists who are writing content for this, uh, for this business readership. And we have, within the Atlantic Media Company, we have a very viable uh, and thriving business. So prior to the launch of um, Quartz, Atlantic Media Chairman David Bradley uh, had said to me, um, I think what Quartz should do and everything, should aim to do in everything that you do is to exhibit boldly creative intelligence. Now we took bold and creative as literally as possible and tried to decide most significant questions by measuring what, which path was the more bold and creative. We did have the advantage of, being, of starting from scratch. There was nothing. Quartz was, uh, didn't exist before 2012. So I'm gonna take the next few minutes um, to talk about where those decisions have taken us. Uh, when designing, what designing a digital news product with a critical approach to questioning legacy assumptions and a premium on creativity, what that's meant, and how it's working today. So the, the founding thought experiment, of course, uh, was what would The Economist magazine be if it was created now and not in 1843? We undertook this out of great reverence for The uh, Economist and respect for its continued relevance in the world today. And on three levels, there are three sort of high-level points that, that we agreed on. The first is that we would be mobile first, um, that's where all of the growth in news readership is. The second is that we should be a really global news organization. Um, our reporters uh, uh, combined uh, speak 25 different languages. We have reporters around the world. There's an opportunity to really report on the new global economy and write for a post-national uh, readership. And the third thing is that we wanted to be journalistic. Uh, a journalistic approach uh, is the way that you create quality content that business readers respect and actually want to read more of. So those are the three things. So now the bold and creative part. Um, so the first thing that was relatively uh, creative on our part, I think, is the name Quartz. We're not named the International 
business global journal newspaper. Um, our name Quartz is pretty unconventional. Um, there's a snarky article in Forbes, which is what you're looking at, um, which sort of uh, expressed this. Um, and kind of interestingly, I, I almost never get asked about the origin of our name uh, at this point with that out of the way. Um, but the point was to convey in, with the name Quartz that we were not a traditional news organization. So among the other first unusual and bold decisions that we took were to forgo two of the bedrocks of traditional uh, digital media. So one was standard advertising units, and the second thing was the home page. So Quartz launched without either one of those things. Um, so all the advertising on Quartz would be bespoke ads. You're looking at some of them now. They appear in the flow of our content. And the idea was that to create beautiful ads that traditional web page layout with the right rail on the page constrained, and the experience would be better for both readers and advertisers. We also carry native advertising and have worked closely with advertisers over the last, um, over the last few years to improve the quality and the engagement of those advertisements. And we've effectively given advertisers the full functionality of our website. So this is an example from GE, which is a 3D browsable globe um, that, that displays a lot of their content. This is very different. This is actually not possible in a standard IEB um, ad unit. We've also forsworn some easy money uh, from pre-rolls, pop-ups, takeovers, um, all of the abuses of a consumer's time that have helped spur the rise of ad blocking software. Of course, as publisher, my colleague Jay Loff wrote in a piece on Medium earlier this week, uh, we don't get in your way. Our ads don't pop up, push content down, or make you wait five to 30 seconds to get to the story you actually wanted to read or the video you actually wanted to watch. We keep our code as light as possible to go easy on your browser. So that's our advertising approach, which is, has been a departure from the traditional approach. The thing I mentioned before um, was that we didn't actually have a homepage when we launched either. We knew that almost no one would come to uh, QZ.com as a homepage and that any focus on it would be a distraction. In the very beginning, when you have zero readers, no one's going to type in QZ.com. What you see here is a, one of the uh, charts from the, from the New York Times Innovation Report last year that shows that even big brands are seeing their homepage uh, traffic declining. This further emphasized to our staff that the focus was on the article page and the quality of the content and its ability to actually spread in the world. Uh, here's an example of a, an interactive um, article that uh, we published that has won some awards that we published uh, late last year um, that works just as well on a phone as it does uh, on a desktop. And it's actually pretty complicated data and code um, behind it. So we do now have a home page. We've come back. Um, but the idea was that we wanted to do something that wasn't just a list of, of links of, uh, to stories that we'd published over the last 24 hours. We wanted to provide our readers with another type of service if they were going to bother to come to our homepage. If you go to QZ.com, you can see the first experiment in what that is. And, and it's basically a news briefing. Um, but it's an experiment that we're continuing uh, to evolve. Our daily brief email, our morning uh, email newsletter, was fairly radical. Uh, when we launched it, because it allowed readers to actually get a summary of uh, the news that had taken place while they were sleeping, um, as if a trusted advisor or a friend had written it for them. The convention when we launched Quartz was that email newsletters were just lists of headlines that were trying to push you off to the publisher's website where they could, where they had sold advertising, it could count you as a unique and a page view um, and an ad impression. Um, so we have five journalists. This actually takes some resources. We have five journalists who touch the email newsletter uh, that if you're, if you're based in Canada or the US, the, the one that you can receive at uh, 6 AM in the morning. This has been overnight updated by a number of journalists. This is a, a commitment of uh, journalistic resources that doesn't actually result in traffic back to our website. But the result is that today we have about 161,000 subscribers to this. About half of them are executives. And the open rate for this newsletter, that's the percentage of emails that we send that are actually opened by a human uh, being, is about 40%, which is a multiple of the industry, uh, industry standard. And I would argue that's because it's meant to be, it's a good, we focused on the, on the user 
um, in doing so. I want to talk about video for a second. Uh, we've recently gotten into video, and rather than, um, rather than take the traditional approach, uh, which is to uh, set to run pre-roll against your video and set pretty steep inventory targets because ad sales forces are able to, to sell pretty high CPM uh, pre-roll inventory uh, at volume. What we did is we hired uh, three polymaths, so uh, journalists who can shoot, edit, um, and produce videos, and gave them six months and told them, you should you should be as creative as possible. Treat this like a laboratory. See what types of video people um, are interested in and publish directly onto Facebook and to YouTube. So we're now about five months into this experiment. We have not monetized our video at all. Um, but these three people have produced videos that have attracted um, almost 40 million views on these different uh, platforms. And we're moving. Uh, we're moving this in the coming days into starting to monetize uh, some of this video. I had worked in video. I knew that it was actually very, um, it was very easy to produce mediocre uh, video content. It also was like surprisingly easy to lose money on it. Um, our approach, not monetizing video uh, for six months, publishing directly on these platforms, is I would argue the bolder and more creative um, an unconventional approach to getting into video. It's one that we've seen incredible uh, results from. Our approach to content more broadly has been unconventional in a number of ways. Um, so one way that uh, we talk about the content that we produce is, the, is what we call the quartz curve. Um, and what this is, is it shows uh, on the y-axis the likelihood of success of a given piece of content. And on the x-axis, it could be a, a variety of different things. In what you're looking at now, you can see the word count of articles. Now, when you look at what people read online, if you look at the data about what people read, the, the, their habits uh, fall broadly onto the left and the right uh, sides of this curve. People read short, focused things, maybe with a visual element like a chart that they can then uh, digest perhaps on their phone and then go on and share with their friends if they actually um, think it is of value. They also actually read long content. So um, if there's a payoff for the reader in terms of the narrative, in terms of the analysis, in terms of the reporting, readers will read uh, feature articles that are thousands of words long. Uh, Quartz publishes at the extremes of this curve. So we publish uh, probably half or more of our articles are under 500 words. They often have a chart accompanying them. Um, but we publish at least daily, we publish an article that is thousands of words long, where we believe there's a, pay, a payoff for the reader for spending the time on it. And the readership of those articles actually confirms that that strategy is successful. I might note as a side note that the um, the standard unit of production of a traditional media organization falls somewhere between the, the sides of the curve. And that's the challenge of uh, news organizations. And it's, it's something that we, working with journalists who have, who have worked at traditional news organizations, um, you know, have had to confront and, and deal with directly. Um, here are two examples of uh, pieces that fall on different sides of the curve that Quartz has written. On the right side, you have a piece that was about uh, 3,000, 4,000 words long, which made the economic case for paternity leave and was accompanied by about 25 charts. It was a very dense economic argument that ultimately uh, gender equality in the workplace requires paternity leave so that men experience the same sort of pauses in their careers uh, that women do, and that, that's one of the surest paths to bring equality more broadly. On the left, you have a tweet from one of, our, one of my colleagues, Matt Phillips, which has Apple's share price. Um, that's at the extreme. Uh, that's at the extreme left of the curve because there's just a handful of words there. Um, but this is this is is one of the keys to reader uh, engagement. So another uh, unconventional approach to content at Quartz has been our use of charts. Um, what you're seeing here are data from a survey of global business executives that we do annually, and uh, among the, you're seeing one of the questions. And the top answer to this question, which feature and formats draw you into a piece of content, is are, are, the answer is charts. So 
what Quartz did is we built our own charting tool. There are plenty of charting tools, but they're actually like kind of hard to use. They're complicated. In most traditional news organizations, the people who make the interactive graphics or the graphics of the chart are a service bureau that sit alongside the journalists, but are actually separate from the journalists who are writing the articles. So what we did is we, at the very beginning of Quartz three years ago, we ourselves developed a tool called Chart Builder. And what this is is a really simple tool to allow all of our journalists uh, to create their own charts. Um, so what you're seeing now is, are some examples of the charts that we made last year. Quartz journalists are a relatively uh, small number of people, probably about 30 uh, writers on average through the course of last year, produced almost uh, 4,000 charts last year. Um, Chart Builder is open sourced. This might be unconventional also. We've made it available uh, to the community and it's actually used by news organizations around the world for their own charts. Um, we do do some bespoke uh, charts. This was not made with Chart Builder. Um, and the point is that uh, charts properly made can actually, are very efficient at conveying information and actually can be really interesting, particularly for business readership. This chart you're seeing might be hard to uh, read, but it's a, it's a kind of interesting data set correlating uh, girls' names uh, in the U.S. and Disney heroines, uh, appearances in Disney films. Um, We've created a platform emboldened by the success of these charts. We've created a platform which is called Atlas. You can visit it at atlas.qz.com. And the idea is that it gives these charts a home on the internet. We make available the underlying data to our charts. We give embed codes for people to use them in their own content. We allow you to download the graphics. Our plan is to open this platform to allow anybody to create charts using Atlas and hope that this becomes the new home for charts and data on the internet as we're able to open it to other people. But you can go there today and, and, and look at the charts that are created by Quartz as journalists. The last thing that I want to talk about in terms of our unconventional approach to content is that um, one of the focuses of Quartz is that we're trying to uh, produce content that's uh, centered around what we call things. It's a sort of vague word. It's hard to, um, it's hard to define it precisely. But it's the sort of thing that you know when you see it. So things are the, the, things are the sort of stuff that when you're talking to people, you say, hey, look at this thing. Isn't this thing interesting? That is a thing. So here's an example of a thing uh, that Quartz published. The Steve Jobs email that outlined uh, Apple's strategy a year before his death. It's a thing. You might say to a friend, did you see that email, that Steve Jobs email that was released as part of a uh, a court case that outlines Apple's strategy going forward. That's a thing. That's different than the traditional approach to writing an article, um, and you can imagine the headline as being much more inscrutable and, and unspecific, actually. Um, things can be surprising facts, charts, photos, can be a long feature, exclusive bit of news argument, a good headline, a, uh, a quip, but they're always one thing. They're very focused. It's not a sort of broad, sprawling idea. It's a focus thing. Here's the economic case for paternity leave. Um, this is a, a recent example where a Quora engineer, um, a, an engineer went on Quora to, um, to ask advice on which job offer he should take. And the CEO of one of the companies that made him an offer went on Quora and actually rescinded the job offer um, because he felt like the engineer wasn't, um, wasn't properly, didn't properly understand why he should work at the um, company. We wrote an article about it. Um, a lot of people the day that we wrote this article, I, we know from the sharing patterns around this, were effectively saying to other people, hey, did you see this thing? Did you see the, the, the stupid guy who got his job offer revoked because he went on Quora and the CEO of the company showed up uh, and revoked his offer? Here are other examples of things. And you can read the headlines and, and probably see why they are, they are things. So the core focus of Quartz, bringing this all back around, is we want to create smart content and advertising for business readers to experience and to share on any device. That's what we do. Um, this is our staff based in New York. Uh, today, we, at this point, we have staff around the world. We have about seven journalists in India, a handful in Africa, a bunch of people in Asia and in Europe. Um, our post-national approach to staffing courts uh, is designed to, to mirror the sort of reader who we're, um, who we're looking to attract. Um, these are the people who are executing on that original charge, which was 
uh, to be bold and creative. It's an approach I'd recommend to all of you in any of uh, the initiatives that you're undertaking. Um, it's been working uh, for us very well so far. So thank you. Kevin, thank you. I found myself emailing myself things you said in that presentation okay. to remember later. The charts application, superb. Thank I you. think that should really, uh, that should really take off. Um, look, still a little bit tight for time, but we're okay, I think, for a question. If there is one from the audience, please uh, make yourself known. Uh, right over there. Is it making it? Yeah. Here we go. Hi, I'm Jackie Locke from St. Joseph Media. Um, you showed some pretty slick examples of bespoke advertising um, th that would require a really high level of uh, knowledge of the content. What does your sales team look like? So Quartz has its own dedicated sales team, which we have from the beginning. Um, and it's staffed both by veteran salespeople. Our publisher, Jay Loft, was, was the publisher of The Atlantic before and of Wired magazine before that. Um, but it also includes an, a lot of, a number of creative uh, people, so people with backgrounds in journalism, content creation. Our sales team includes a handful of developers and designers as well. And so the approach to create the ads, as you, as you rightly recognize, is a lot of involvement on the part of our marketing and sales staff with the advertisers. The, the GE example that I showed you um, is actually like relatively cutting edge development for the interactivity that was involved. Behind it, there's a pretty complicated database that pulls in uh, geo-coded content that GE uh, has created uh, in different geographies around the world. Um, this requires a very deep uh, collaboration and developers, designers, creative people on staff within Quartz to actually work with the advertisers to get that. Okay, and there was just one more. If it's a fairly quick one, we'll take that. Hi, is Quartz profitable? Um, so That's a quick one. Yeah, that is a quick so one. We're a, um, so we're a private company. Uh, we don't disclose our financials, so I can't answer the question. Um, what I can say is that um, our business is really is doing really well, and we have a very solid business here. The core mission of a lot of us uh, with Quartz, people who had worked at the Wall Street Journal and The Economist and these other places, was to create something that helped ensure that quality content was thriving in our digital era. The verb thriving is really important. Um, because that implies that you do have a profitable business, that you have something that is sustaining over time. Um, we believe that um, that Quartz is, uh, that Quartz, um, I don't know what, what tends to use here, Quartz will be a profitable business. Um, and the, the advertising has been incredibly promising. We've had about 150 advertisers, blue chip advertisers at this point, um, with a 90% renewal rate for advertisers. We're charging pretty high prices for these bespoke ads. Advertisers are coming back. We have an events business, which is another revenue stream this year. We're doing events on four continents. We did one in New Delhi yesterday, uh, Nairobi last month. Um, and so this is, a, this, is a, uh, this is a really solid business. And I'm sorry, I can't answer your question directly. And that is all we've got time for. Please can I ask you to thank Kevin Delaney. Thank you. Thank you.